Okay, well, let's, uh, let's start. I'm uh, very happy to introduce and welcome our last speaker of the day, Dimitri Kazaris, uh, who is at Duke University and who's done some really exciting work recently with a number of, uh, a number of uh, people that are in the, in the Zoom presence. And the title will be uh, Comparison Geometry for Scalar Curvature and Space-Time Harmonic Functions. Dimitri, please. All right, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation and for organizing this very nice uh, uh, conference. All right, so uh, yeah, before I uh, get into it, I want to uh, point out this is a joint work with uh, Sven Hirsch, uh, graduate student at Duke, Marcus Curie, professor at Stony Brook, and uh, E.U. Tang, uh, postdoc at Irvine. All right, so this will be a little bit of a um, uh, excursion. Uh, the, the main technical results that I want to tell you about will be uh, on the uh, pure geometry side of things, uh, but the main point of talking about them here is uh, that they are, in a sense, a corollary of a recent proof of the space-time positive mass theorem uh, with uh, <clears throat> Sven Hirsch and Marcus Curie. Okay, so I want to discuss that. Uh, and discuss these applications and hopefully make uh, the circle of kind of pure geometry, you could call it comparison geometry for scalar curvature, uh, ideas that have been uh, brewing for the last several years. Uh, I hope to have a coherent story about all these, <laughs> all these things. Uh, and please uh, let me know if there are any questions. Uh, I really intend for this to be accessible to everyone. Okay. Oh yeah, and you know, there's some other selling points of these results. <laughs> so, well, I'll get to it when I get to it. Uh, okay, so here's the game plan. A little picture, me explaining the game plan. Uh, so first I wanna tell you about this uh, kind of formula for the ADM mass of asymptotically flat initial data, three-dimensional uh, initial data uh, that I just mentioned. So this proof using these uh, special geometric uh, functions, the space-time uh, harmonic functions. <clears throat> then I'll tell you what I mean by comparison geometry and why we should care about it. And uh, I want to explain this kind of circle of there's, there's, there's three results that I want to tell you about uh, that we recover proofs of and prove slightly, uh, you know, we prove some uh, more qualitative versions of them, you could say. Uh, and I want to tell a coherent story about how these things relate to one another. Uh, because it's not, it's not totally clear if you're not following the story closely. Uh, and then I'll tell you about how the actual proofs go. <clears throat> All right, but uh, I know we have a, a slightly wider uh, audience here that might not be interested in pure geometric analysis so, or pure geometry for geometry's sake. So here's my, uh, here's my 60 second pitch. That'll probably be three minutes or something. But okay, so here's the, here's the, uh, you know, the sound bite here. All right, so as I mentioned, there's a uh, uh, formula, quote unquote, for uh, the ADM mass of a three-dimensional uh, initial data set. So just to be clear, I'm talking about three-dimensional manifold with a metric G, second fundamental form, you know, which is just abstractly a symmetric two tensor K, which satisfy you know, some decay conditions that uh, we call asymptotic flatness. And the star of that show is uh, the following uh, almost linear, I mean, it's not, it's not quite linear, uh, uh, geometric PDE, which is like the, I mean, it's the harmonic equation if uh, the second fundamental form is zero, so if it's time symmetric, uh, but in general, it's a uh, elliptic equation that carries around some information about the, uh, second fundamental form of the initial data set. And the idea is uh, by looking at some kind of uh, modified funky version of a, a Bachner type identity that was derived in a pure geometry setting by uh, Daniel Stern recently. And uh, we realized there was a similar idea going on by Jezierski in the eighties, also crucial was in, involved in that story. Uh, <clears throat> which is a very not obvious thing to do. And it gives something quite remarkable in dimension three. Uh, I can explain this more later if uh, anyone would like. Uh, the, the, the point here is 
that uh, if you imagine your MGK is inside of a, uh, you know, space time uh, N, I don't need to say N, but if, if it's inside of a space time with a, a unit time like normal E naught, uh, then you should compare the differential of our solution to this uh, equation plus something that makes the resulting vector null. You know, I call this kind of like a null. Yeah, so this resulting one form would be null in the uh, three plus one dimensional space time. And that is comparable to uh, something related to the uh, type of spinner that Witten uses in his proof of the positive mass theorem. Uh, in the following way. Uh, if you take a, the, so here, let's work with SL2C spinners. If you take the, the tensor product of that representation, you can identify that with, the, with forms on the, on the four manifold. Uh, and this thing here, this, uh, this null version of the differential of the main star of this positive, uh, proof of positive mass theorem um, is comparable to the one form part of what you get when you square the spinner. So when you square a spinner in general, it breaks up into some different ranks, differential forms. And this is kind of like looking at the, uh, the one form part of it. Another way to think of it as uh, is, uh, so you can think of a, a vial spinner as a null flag pole, so a null, a null pole and then a, a flag at the end of it. And the, the, this, uh, this one form that I'm uh, arrow pointing at is comparable to just the flag pole itself. But importantly, we've arranged for it to be integrable in the sense that it's the differential of a function. And that's a key, key aspect. I'll, I'll explain this a little bit more in a second. This was supposed to be 60 seconds. Uh, OK, so new proof of positive mass theorem using some, uh, you know, in, this is an interesting formula for mass. OK, so today we, uh, I want to describe how uh, we realized that this has, you know, this proof and these ideas have uh, important applications to this kind of new area of trying to uh, understand uh, the metric geometry or general geometry of purely Ramanian manifolds satisfying a lower positive bound on scalar curvature, which is a very, you know, it's a very weak condition. So it's very, it's, it's, a, it's an old and kind of mysterious and recently very active uh, area of geometric analysis. What can you say about the geometry of a manifold satisfying these conditions? It's a subtle and hard problem. And there's lots of activity, yeah. And what is the idea? Well, uh, you know, what does this pure Ramanian manifold have to do with the proof of the positive mass theorem? Well, the idea is given some uh, Ramanian manifold satisfying a lower positive band bound on scalar curvature, uh, construct a phony baloney second fundamental form to form an initial data set, MGK. Uh, but you should construct this phony baloney form uh, in a way that reflects the metric structure of the underlying Ramanian manifold. Uh, and that will be accomplished by choosing K to be a, uh, well, proportional to the metric itself. Uh, and that uh, proportionality, that, that function, uh, should be a function of distance to some important submanifold or something reflecting uh, some interesting. Uh, metric structure of the underlying Ramanian manifold. Although what you want to prove, it's not clear, but we'll get to that. Uh, and now the dominant energy condition for the resulting initial data set that you build this way, um, you know, involves F and a derivative of F because the, the local linear momentum involves derivatives of F. So that gives you a kind of equation uh, that relates two things. It relates, uh, this kind of this differential equation for uh, f having to do with distance to uh, some boundary term in general you know you could sort of think of it as mass uh, and uh, you get interesting theorems by comparing those two quantities in the resulting you know mass formula that i'll explain in a moment okay so let's get into some more uh, specifics uh, hopefully you absorb these little keynotes if you're going to tune out uh, but anyways, I, I encourage you not to, and to please ask me any questions uh, uh, yeah, at any time. Okay, so uh, let me tell you what, you know, let me describe this proof of positive mass theorem in a little bit more, in more detail here. <clears throat> okay, so 
given the, uh, you know, we need these formulas a, a little bit, uh, but I won't, I won't uh, spend too much time here. Okay, so for asymptotically flat initial data, so, you know, you remove a compact set, you have a map to, to R3 minus a ball with some uh, decay conditions here. Uh, we allow the most general decay conditions. Uh, you have these uh, local energy momentum densities, mu and j. So I think I have followed the, the usual conventions here. Uh, and uh, I need a little bit more uh, terminology here. There's this, uh, so there is a, I just described a uh, space-time harmonic equation. Let me describe a space-time Hessian. Uh, I'll, I'll denote it with a nabla bar squared of some function on our three-dimensional manifold. Uh, it'll be like a usual Hessian, but it's twisted by the second fundamental form of the uh, ambient uh, connection. Or you know, twisted by the second fundamental form uh, of the initial data set. You can think of it in the following way: uh, you take your function, compute its differential, form a null one form from that, apply the ambient connection to it, and then take the tangential part of what remains. Very much like what Witten does for uh, a spinner on an initial data set. Consider it's not a not a three-dimensional SU2 spinner, it considers like a S SL2C spinner, uh, and it uses the ambient connection on that thing. Similar idea here. And so, you know, this is a, the prototype is, if you're in Minkowski space, you could consider a, a function like so, T plus spatial coordinate X, uh, and that will have vanishing space-time Hessian. So vanishing space-time Hessian roughly means that there is a null and parallel field on the space time that you embed into. Okay, so um, here's the, the, the mass formula. You, you saw the, uh, the space time harmonic equation subject to asymptotically linear uh, conditions, something like uh, drawn over here. <clears throat> U minus one of the asymptotically flat coordinates uh, decays it. Well, it doesn't actually decay, but the differential will decay. Um, to zero as, as you go out. Um, you could consider these space-time harmonic asymptotically flat coordinates, although they're defined everywhere. They're not coordinates everywhere, only coordinates at uh, infinity. Oh yeah, I mentioned here, uh, Carla Saderbaum was mentioning that harmonic coordinates are not sensitive to the second fundamental form of uh, your initial data set. Maybe these are, these should be natural candidates for uh, you know, nice coordinates on an initial data set, which are sensitive to the second fundamental form. Although I don't have anything more to say about that at all. It's interesting to uh, investigate there. Uh, okay, and here is the resulting, uh, you know, what results from the, what I call the funky Bachner formula. Uh, you can prove the following. So there is some, you have to choose the direction appropriately relative to, you know, whatever the, the total linear momentum vector is. Uh, but you can uh, show the following. The mass of this initial data set, the ADM mass, is bounded from uh, below by 1 over 16 pi, and then this integral. Now, there are two quantities in this, this integral. There's uh, a positive term, which is, uh, this is, by the way, an a extension of that, that, that formula that uh, uh, Dan Lee spoke about uh, yesterday, but, uh, or I guess two days ago. Uh, okay, so. There's the space-time Hessian squared, positive term. And then there is something which is not negative if the dominant energy condition is satisfied. And so it's very transparent that, uh, you know, positive mass theorem here. Uh, and let me remark that there's also uh, uh, rigidity, uh, uh, which you can accomplish with the help of uh, uh, Huang Li, or uh, which was just, Spoke about in the in the last in the last talk, uh, or uh, uh, recent work of Hirsch and Singh. But the idea, heuristically, is that from in, in the case of equality, from U, you can build a parallel null field on the ambient uh, on, on some killing development, and then that will kind of you, you can finagle that to then show that the, uh, this this killing development is flat morally. Okay. <clears throat> So that's uh, that's the uh, positive mass 
the, I mean, that's the mass formula, which is which will serve as the uh, fundamental tool for what happens later. All right, so let me just tell you, uh, you know, there's a lot of experts here, uh, but I want to be extra clear. Uh, let me just say what 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 the name of the game is in the, in this pure geometry uh, sort of result that that we're going for. What, what what's the point of uh, what I'm about to tell you about the main the main technical results? Uh, okay, so here's general what it means when when I say the word or the phrase uh, comparison theorem. So usually you're interested in some curvature condition, some some quantity Q that you cook up from the curvature of your Ramanian manifold. And you would like to understand what does it mean for this Q to be bigger than some number kappa. And one of the usual ways of going about this, but we'll see there's more than one sort of thing you can do, uh, is you want to consider a model space uh, with, cur with curvature kappa. Um, and usually that model space is taken to be the, uh, the space form with constant curvature kappa. You know, simply connected one, so it's Euclidean space, hyperbolic space, or a sphere, round sphere. Uh, and the idea is, we want you know a comparison theorem would be any sort of theorem which would uh, compare some geometric feature of a general manifold satisfying a lower bound on Q to that same geometric feature of the model space in some sharp way. So you're probably familiar with many. Uh, you know, if you've taken courses in Ramanian geometry, there are many famous examples that are uh, very useful. So for instance, for sectional curvature, when that uh, curvature quantity is sectional curvature, there's the triangle comparison, which is uh, fundamental. In fact, you don't need to compare to a model space. You can just compare any two spaces with the inequality between sectional curvatures. And that's roughly uh, displayed in this picture at the bottom. Uh, if your manifold is at least as curved as, say, a sphere on the right-hand side of some curvature, then uh, if you shoot out geodesics from a single point of length L, the distance between the endpoints will be no bigger than uh, the distance between corresponding geodesics in the model space. So I'll illustrate that with the little, little brown, brown circles there. All right, and there's also a version for sectional curvatures, which are less than or equal to, to kappa, go either way. Uh, for Ricci curvature, is a, you know, this is a famous story that's been very active since the 90s, uh, and I guess earlier. Uh, one of the most famous ones is the bishop Roma volume comparison, uh, which if you have Ricci curvature, at least that of, say, some sphere, then, or, or some, uh, you know, Euclidean space or hyperbolic space, then, uh, the, the following ratio of volumes of balls to the volumes of balls in the model spaces is not increasing. Okay, but you know, as, as we know, that story goes a lot uh, deeper, uh, culminating in this, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a convexity of entropy of uh, uh, something having to do with optimal transport. Let me not say too much more about that. It's not so related, but it's a, I want to point it out for what I want to say next. <clears throat> Anyway, so there's a very deep story, long and deep story about uh, you know these comparison theorems for Ricci and sectional curvatures. <clears throat> Let me leave up the what I just said about the Ricci curvature here. <clears throat> okay, so why are, why would you care uh, if you're really into differential geometry? You you just like it probably like me. But uh, if you are in another area, why do you care? Well, okay. They're useful because they are, you know, some effective articulation of a geometric notion, like, oh, positive Ricci curvature. That should mean that your space is round. Uh, and that's articulated by, say, uh, the, the Laplace comparison, which says that, like, the, your distance function, distance to a point, uh, is at least as convex as the distance function is on a round sphere. And so that tells you, oh, okay, for instance, you know, I have to have a diameter bound on my manifold, because I know that the distance function on a sphere has to uh, start decreasing at some point uh, that I know in terms of its Ricci curvature. Uh, therefore, my space, uh, the distance function must uh, cease to be, you know, minimizing. It must reach a critical point uh, before then. So you can, make an, you can make an argument with words instead of a geometric analysis, uh, formulas and equations. Uh, 
Okay, but that's not so, okay, that maybe that's not so compelling. Here's something that is compelling. In the things that I've just uh, discussed for sectional curvature and for Ricci curvature, they allow for entirely synthetic treatments of uh, the study of geometries satisfying a lower sectional curvature or Ricci curvature bound. So people study Alexandrov spaces, which are only defined uh, in terms of triangle comparison. And so it may, you can, you know, the, the entire uh, field can just be, uh, you know, understanding uh, sectional curvature metrics. You don't really need to think about the Ramanian manifold anymore, the Ramanian metric. You can just think about the comparison theorem. It's that powerful so that you can completely geometrically understand this condition just by the comparison theorem. That's the ultimate level that you want to get to. This is also more or less true, and this is still being developed for uh, Ricci curvature. You can define these uh, RCD NK or kappa N, as I've said it here, metric measure spaces, which satisfy this uh, this entropy uh, condition, uh, which is uh, you know defined using optimal transport. So you can do entirely synthetic treatments uh, of these things. Just, just prove everything about these manifolds, these geometries, just using these comparison theorems, essentially. Why, why is that useful? Well, this can uh, allow you to make a uh, sense of a, a, a weak notion or a synthetic notion of what this curvature condition means. This allows you to do blow-up arguments like you see in the you know, proof of Poincaré conjecture, things like that. Uh, it's a, this is a fundamental... Uh, pursuit, I would say. <clears throat> and let me just say, you know, we should be interested in uh, developing this theory for scalar curvature since this is the probably the most important part of the dominant energy condition. Uh, and so you could say if you understand uh, the geometry of a manifold with a lower sectional or uh, scalar curvature bound, you're understanding spatial geometry uh, better. Okay, so that's the pitch. Uh, now let's get into uh, the ideas, the, the mathematical ideas. All right, so what, what we already saw, you know, the basic uh, comparison theorem for Ricci curvature, which is Meyer's theorem <clears throat> for positive uh, Ricci curvature, and that says that the diameter of your manifold cannot exceed uh, the diameter of the corresponding, you know, I, I've renormalized in a weird way here, so there's a square root of n minus one, but uh, it says that the, the diameter of your manifold cannot exceed the diameter of the, the corresponding comparison sphere. And so you can interpret that as saying, well, you shoot off in any direction, uh, a geodesic, you fix any point, shoot off in any direction, a geodesic, it will cease to be minimizing within this amount of time. <clears throat> you can interpret that as saying, well, your manifold cannot expand much in any given direction. If you have positive Ricci curvature or a definite lower positive bound of Ricci curvature. Well, if you go to, to a scalar curvature now, that's like taking a trace of Ricci curvature. Uh, okay, well, you know, if your scalar curvature is positive, you could still have n minus one directions of negative Ricci curvature. All you're really guaranteed is that there is a single direction of positive Ricci curvature. So somehow, you should be able to apply that above Ricci curvature argument in that one remaining direction, at least. Uh, so you're only left with the following weak uh, you know, heuristic, which is that if you have positive scalar curvature, OK, you could get large in n minus 1 directions, but you can't get large in all directions at the same time. So this leads you to uh, you know, the Garrosh conjecture. Uh, proven in uh, dimensions seven and below by Shen Yao and in all dimensions by Gromov Lawson that the torus cannot support positive scalar curvature because for whatever notion, whatever precise articulation of can't get, uh, whatever notion of gets big in all directions at the same time, the torus should satisfy it because by passing to larger and larger covers of the torus, you can make the torus, you know, and lifting the metric, you know, to make it a, a Romanian map, uh, you can lift the metric and you make it large in all directions at the same time. That's the kind of fundamental topological feature of the torus. It gets big in all directions in, in most senses. Okay, one route to proving this is the following, which is not historical, but let me just uh, 
share it because it will be the start of our story. <clears throat> okay, so suppose you have a metric on the torus cross an interval. The uh, precise numbers zero and one are immaterial. That's just meant to represent an, an interval. So that I'm not. I'm not thinking this is a distance one or anything. It's just a just an interval. So suppose we have a Riemannian metric on a what I'll refer to as a torus band, the torus cross an interval torus band. Um, <clears throat> if the scalar curvature is at least that of the sphere of the same dimension, this is the common you know way of renormalizing things. Uh, then, well, okay, you're in a situation where uh, so here's a little picture of the tn minus one cross zero to one. You have a torus of co-dimension one here. And so you already know that that can get big in n minus one directions. So your manifold is already getting big in n minus one directions. But since you have positive scalar curvature, you should not be able, you should have to be small in the remaining direction. And this is exactly what the theorem says, uh, that the distance between uh, the left side and the right side cannot exceed 2 pi over n. So if you have positive scalar curvature and you can get very large in n minus one directions, then you cannot be large in the, in the last direction. You must be small in this, in this, in this sense, it's precise articulation. Therefore, the torus, <laughs> I mean, this is a little bit circular, but the torus can't have positive scalar curvature because you, know, you lift to uh, bigger and bigger covers and you can find an arbitrarily wide uh, torus band in a cover. Right? So the torus definitely can, if this, if, if this theorem is true, then the torus definitely cannot have a positive scalar curvature. That's, that's not historically the correct way of going about things, but it is uh, one, one, per, one approach that you can uh, uh, take. Uh, this, by the way, there's a lot of attention given to this recently, but this was already proven in the, in the 80s by Gromov and Lawson. And it uh, uses minimal surfaces, the, the version they do there. So that it's restricted, at least in, this, uh, in their paper there, to dimension seven and below. OK, so you can, so OK, this will take us a little, uh, you know, a five minute excursion here. But uh, let's say uh, it, it'll be kind of a, important here. OK, so uh, what should you prove in general? We just prove something for the torus. Uh, but in general, if you have an enlargeable manifold, a manifold which can get large in all directions, and this precisely means uh, you have a manifold so that given any epsilon, you can find some big cover and bar and lift the metric up there uh, so that on that larger manifold, you can find an extremely contractive map to SM. You really squeeze uh, the distances down onto uh, SN in, in a non zero degree uh, mapping. Then you would call your manifold enlargeable. And actually, it turns out to just be a homotopy invariant. Doesn't actually depend on the metric, doesn't actually depend on the smooth structure or the topological structure, just the homotopy type of the manifold. <clears throat> and what they, uh, Gromov and Lawson, showed the fundamental thing is that if you're spin and you're enlargeable, you cannot support positive scalar curvature. The same logic should apply for non-spin manifolds, but they only conclude it for spin manifolds. And in fact, there's a, a sharp version of this result. So we're not interested just in the obstruction problem, right? We're trying to do comparison geometry. We want sharp geometric comparison results. And here's a sharp version of it. Uh, it's called the rules theorem. So if you're spin and you have scalar, oh, this should be a one. If your scalar curvature is at least that of the sphere of the same dimension, uh, and you have a non-zero degree map to the sphere, uh, then the Lipschitz constant must be bigger than one. You must be uh, making some distances bigger. The, the picture would be if you have a tiny sphere, which has you know, really big scalar curvature, versus a larger sphere, well, you can map by the identity, and that would be increasing distances. Distance increases. But it's sharp in the following sense. If you have a Lipschitz constant one map, then <clears throat> you must be isometric to the sphere, not only diffeomorphic, but, but isometric to the, to the round sphere. So it's a sharp version uh, of this articulation of enlargeable, met, uh, enlargeable manifolds shouldn't support positive scalar curvature. This is a comparison theorem style uh, 
statement. <clears throat> okay, so now let me go and I gotta I gotta draw it, you know, by hand a little bit here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so Gromov would kind of started this this story in like uh, 2016, 2018. So now we're getting we're getting closer to contemporary work. Um, okay, so he has the, you know, I think I'm putting words in his mouth, but I think he was uh, interested in can you do something similar for non-spin manifolds? Is there a sharp uh, estimate? for Lipschitz maps from non-spin manifolds with positive scalar curvature to the sphere. For instance, uh, you know, you could ask, could, uh, I mean, this is silly since it's already proven, but, you know, could, could, uh, can you prove uh, that the uh, torus connects some CP2 doesn't have positive scalar curvature, which you can already prove with minimal surfaces, but that, that would be an application of uh, this sort of thing. You know, that, that's, an, that's a non-spin manifold is all I'm saying. <clears throat> Okay, so the idea is interesting, and it takes us to another comparison theorem that I want to talk about. This is why. Okay, so his idea in this in this paper called metric uh, inequalities, which is rather influential. Uh, one of the main ideas is to do uh, the following. Okay, so you can't apply the La Rule theorem. You can't, uh, you know, because because that relies on some twisted spinners that may or may not exist on an arbitrarily manifold, arbitrary manifold. <clears throat> the idea is the following. Um, maybe you can try to find a torus inside of a sphere. I mean, okay, you can always do that, but <laughs> try to find a optimal torus, a torus with very large normal injectivity radius. Okay, by injectivity radius, I mean like a normal focal radius. There's different notions for it, but it's the largest uh, uh, radius so that the tubular neighborhood, uh, you know, the exponential function is non-singular on, on the, that, that tubular neighborhood. Okay, so step one of this idea to establish some sharp estimate for non-spin manifolds in the spirit of the rule theorem, <clears throat> find a gigantic, you know, a, a torus with gigantic normal uh, tubular neighborhood. You know? Yeah. <coughs> Not just tubular neighborhood, but, you know, a normal bundle, non-singular normal bundle. All right. Uh, well, then if you're given, let me point a little bit, given some non-spin manifold, Mg with the right scalar curvature bound and a map to the sphere. Do the following: take your uh, normal, you know, non-singular uh, normal bundle of the torus that you found. This great torus that you found inside of the sphere, the round sphere, just the torus in the round sphere. Uh, take the pre-image via the map L, and then all of a sudden, I mean, it's not so surprising, but you've got a, a torus band inside of your non-spin manifold. And now you can apply the torus band inequality. So on one hand, the uh, distance from one side to the other in this, of this uh, band inside of the uh, non-spin manifold M, uh, that is bounded uh, by whatever the, the, the width of the torus band inside of the sphere was, and then divided by the Lipschitz constant of the map. And on the other hand, from the torus band inequality, we know that it can't exceed two pi over N. So that gives you a lower bound on Lipschitz constant of your map. And it gets better and better if you can find a wider and wider, you know, a torus with a, a, a bigger and bigger uh, normal uh, neighborhood. Prototypical example is the Clifford torus, the minimal Clifford torus inside of uh, S3, you know, which is you know, the product of two circles inside of C2, that lies inside of the S3, inside of uh, C2, and uh, its normal injectivity radius is uh, pi over four. <clears throat> so you are led to being very interested in what is the optimal, what, what is the, <laughs> how big can I make this uh, normal neighborhood of an embedded torus in a sphere? Or more generally, you could ask about what's the uh, largest uh, normal injectivity radius of an embedded uh, torus in any sectional bigger than one manifold. The, it's, not, it's very not clear in higher dimensions, by the way. The, the, the estimate, the, the Lipschitz estimate that uh, uh, Gromov gets in this paper is highly non-optimal in higher dimensions. He actually gives a very, very interesting and 
maybe underappreciated uh, construction of these of these tori. Uh, but it's you know it's far from being uh, the optimal constant. From getting the optimal estimate of Lipschitz uh, has to be bigger than one. Uh, okay, yeah, but anyways, but in dimension three, you can make this conjecture that, you know, the Clifford torus should be the optimal one. That fills up all of the sphere and that the, it feels very optimal. And so that's a conjecture. If you have a three manifold with sectional curvature at least one, then the largest uh, uh, that the normal injectivity radius of an embedded torus can be is pi over four. This is proven very recently by Jin uh, Tzu, um, published this year, uh, and it comes with the rigidity statement. And this is a kind of a new style of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a not exactly standard, but it uses the techniques all I mean, I'm going to be saying about. Okay, so let me just give you a little overview about what's, what I said. So there's a lot there. Okay, so we got the rule theorem, you have the torus band inequality, and then you have the normal injectivity radius uh, bound. And they're interrelated in the following way. La rule theorem, that's kind of what you want. That is a... Uh, sharp comparison theorem uh, for uh, positive scalar curvature manifolds. Torus band is also a similar thing, uh, but it has an alternative uh, role in the following argument. If you want to prove the rule theorem for all manifolds, you should look for uh, you know, large toric bands inside of spheres, and those are kind of discovered or estimated or ruled out by uh, this normal injectivity radius bound. All of these three things you would call sharp comparison theorems, but they're all related to scalar curvature geometry um, in the way that I just, in, the, in that kind of like heuristic argument I just outlined. Okay. <clears throat> so let me tell you about the techniques that are involved because a lot of them come from and inform uh, the study of initial data sets in general relativity. Okay, so here's the, the torus band inequality uh, uh, again. <clears throat> uh, by the way, uh, you have equality for a particular warped product uh, of a torus with an interval, flat, flat torus with an interval. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's like an incomplete manifold. It's a strange way to get rigidity. The rigidity is not a uh, typical geometry. It's not. <clears throat> it's not a constant sectional curvature. Okay, so the, the original proof uh, was by <clears throat> what was the state of the art at the time, uh, this uh, fisher colby shane uh, symmetrization type of argument, uh, where you take a minimal surface. In the picture here, it's, uh, it's kind of spanning the torus band, take a minimal surface like so, uh, and then you form a more symmetrical torus band by taking a warped product with uh, S1. You take this minimal thing, you take a warped product with S1, and the warping function is the first eigenfunction of the, uh, you know, the principal eigenfunction of the Jacobi operator of the minimal, the stable minimal surface. And what you have to prove and what, <laughs> what they prove is that uh, you have only increased the width of this uh, well, I mean, you haven't changed the width of this thing, of this band, uh, and you've only increased its scalar curvature. So you're only in a, so you're in a more symmetric, more precarious situation. And eventually you can reduce down to a, uh, you, you really just need to prove the statement for a warped product of an interval with a flat torus, uh, which just reduces to some OD. And you can show that that OD, you know, it's, it's got to be the solution has to be something like sine that kind of peters out at either end and only you know and fails to give a metric uh, in a, in a given finite amount of time. Okay, <clears throat> now it's getting a little more interesting. So a uh, very recent work, uh, uh, Rudy Zeidler and uh, Simone Cincini have been uh, developing a, a spinorial version of uh, this kind of uh, idea. Uh, well, I, I'm going a little bit out of order here. So, <laughs> the, 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 one of the main things here is this uh, is the mu bubble uh, uh, proof of uh, this uh, this kind of theorem. Uh, and uh, Seidler Cicini have been developing a spinorial version of this. So I'll, I'll have to say what mu bubble means later. But uh, there is a spinorial version of this where uh, 
you know, I'll compare the three approaches uh, together, but the idea is to look at some twisted Dirac operator with a potential. And that potential encodes some metric geometry and uh, invertibility of that uh, Dirac operator with potential involves some ODE for that, what I'm calling psi here. Uh, and you have a very similar story to what I'm about to say for mu bubbles. Uh, and then uh, I'd also like to mention the work of uh, Daniel Rada, who uh, recently proved some similar and surprising band type inequalities, uh, but not just for tor torical bands, but for more general bands, which is also what uh, uh, Tatini and Zeidler are working on. Not just a torus, but you know any manifold for which there is a spin obstruction to having positive scalar curvature. You can show the same or similar estimate for the, for the width of those types of bands. Okay, so let me just give you, so I, I believe probably uh, uh, our, uh, our leader, uh, Martin here, will, will give us a, a more in-depth description of these uh, in his talk, but uh, let me just briefly tell you what, what a mu bubble is. So something that Gromov introduced in 2016, uh, and I didn't know what to make of it when he was first talking about it, but the idea is the following. You, you have some uh, manifold, which looks like a band, like a, n cross an interval. <clears throat> and a priori, maybe you don't know there's a minimal surface in there. And we like minimal surfaces because they allow us to uh, say something about the geometry and topology related to scalar curvature. Uh, so here's a fix for it. Introduce a signed measure, mu, and then consider the following functional, which is uh, consider uh, regions omega, which contain one side of this tube, uh, and then its boundary is somewhere in the middle of the, of the manifold. The functional is compute the area of the boundary, but then uh, subtract off the measure of the region omega. This is a functional that's like a critical points give you like uh, surface tension uh, for, for like, a, like a bubble, like a literal soap film. So they're called mu bubbles because they're, you know, they're, they're literally related to uh, bubbles, the type of variational uh, uh, properties of bubbles. Okay, <clears throat> now here is the idea. Uh, oh, sorry, can I cover it up? Whatever I want to say. Choose mu to have a special form. Just be a multiple of the volume form of your metric. Okay, so h here is some function on your manifold. Then a critical point of a mu bubble functional will have a mean curvature equal to the prescribed function h, and uh, stability implies this chunk of change here, this, uh, uh, this mess here. Well, it's not a mess, but I mean, so it, it, it's similar to the stability and equality for a minimal surface, but it has some extra terms here. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, uh, Chodosh Lee and uh, Lazur Unger and Yao have also been pushing forward this, uh, this technique of uh, mu bubbles here. Okay, and the, and the point is, if you can choose H appropriately, then you can make uh, these terms together positive, or I, I've got, they're on the left-hand side, so they should be, uh, yeah, I mean, you can make them positive. Uh, and then, the, and then you, you would uh, conclude that the uh, minimizer of the mu bubble functional is uh, Yamabe positive, has positive scalar curvature. And then you can play a similar game that you usually do with minimal surfaces inside of manifolds with uh, scalar curvature bound. Okay, so uh, compare this junk uh, here that I have in red to uh, what you get from the uh, Lishnerovich formula for the twisted Dirac operator with potential. So it's uh, you know, a little bit similar and I'll compare these uh, again in, in a moment. Oh yeah, another interpretation uh, is that uh, a mu bubble will satisfy something like this, uh, h is equal to uh, little h, uh, which is a, a Mott's uh, type equation for uh, uh, initial data set that you construct by k being equal to, uh, uh, I guess, h over n minus one g, I believe. <clears throat> This is observed by uh, uh, Lee Lazord Unger as well. Okay, uh, but I, I, won't, I won't discuss that much. Uh, so uh, if you use some basic inequalities like uh, 
the mean curvature. Oh, by the way, this is these mu bubbles. They're supposed to, in this regime at least, detect uh, warped products or 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 manifolds which are foliated by constant mean curvature uh, hypersurfaces. This is what they're attuned to uh, detecting. Uh, so you will want to use this this inequality because it's sharp for uh, you know umbilic uh, surfaces or fiber surfaces. Uh, so, okay, if you use this inequality and use this obvious uh, uh, Cauchy-Schwartz here, uh, or I'll, I'll use H for, uh, oh, sorry, I, I didn't mention this yet, but we'll choose H to be a function of distance to one side of the band. So H will just be a single variable function of distance to left-hand side of the manifold. Then you get this uh, important quantity in the stability inequality. If this is non-negative, then uh, you get Yamabe positivity of a stable mu bubble. Okay, and then the prototype is uh, kind of this uh, this tangent function. If you look at this ODE, you know, in dimension three, the ODE would be like a six plus, uh, let's see, three over two H squared minus two H prime. And this is a prototypical example of a OD, I mean, this equal to zero is the, is the typical uh, uh, ODE that blows up in two points. So, you know, if you just have, it, well, okay, let me not say there, but that, that's, the, that's the behavior of, of this ODE. It's like a tangent function. Okay, what this is good for is the following. Um, I realize this is a lot of uh, logic to keep in your head at the same time, but I'll go over this again in a moment uh, in another regime. Uh, okay, so the point is, if you have a stable mu bubble uh, and you satisfy uh, this kind of, um, you know, this thing being non-negative, uh, then the minimizer has to be Yamabe positive, which can give you a contradiction in the right situation. Uh, and the point is, if the band is wide enough, then you have barriers for this minimization problem. Okay, but let me not uh, uh, delve into that further. All right, so now let me talk about uh, the uh, applications of our positive mass theorem, uh, pos you know, our, our mass formula. Okay, so let, let's discuss the uh, torus. Uh, well, let, let's, let's discuss this situation. Okay, let uh, let f be a function of distance to you know we're we're considering a manifold which has two parts, a left hand side which we have a denoting with a minus sign and a right hand side which is boundary plus n. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll we'll have a function which is distance to uh, a function of single variable function of distance to uh, the left hand side. Now the space-time harmonic equation we'll want to solve is is here uh, with a boundary you know Dirichlet boundary conditions plus and minus one on the respective sides. Okay, then if you write down the mass formula in this situation, you get the following. <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you have a boundary term uh, which relates the values of f on the boundary to the mean curvature of the boundary. This capital H is mean curvature of the boundary of boundary M. On the right-hand side, we have the space-time Hessian appearing as usual. And now we have the dominant energy condition, which can be uh, bounded from below by this quantity here, scalar curvature plus six F squared minus four uh, F prime. And then we have another term, which didn't appear in the previous version because I ignored it, because uh, because you know it, it was not uh, relevant. Uh, which is minus four uh, times the value, the, the, the integral of the Euler characteristics of the level sets of the space-time harmonic functions. These sigma t's are the level sets of uh, the uh, space-time harmonic function. You integrate the Euler characteristic of those level sets, which is a strange thing to do, but you can nevertheless do it. Okay, so now we have these uh, kind of three so I have a, we have a comparison between three different kind of ODE or sort of things that you want to be equal to zero in order to get some positivity. Uh, for us, we have uh, this quantity here. Yeah, so unfortunately, all, all three groups, the space-time harmonic, the uh, Dirac operator with potential, and the mu bubble people, we've all renormalized in slightly different ways. <laughs> uh, but, but they're all equivalent is, is the point. Uh, so if you have a mu bubble, then you have this ODE. Uh, 
and Dirac operator with potential to get invertibility of that Dirac operator. You have this quantity that you want to be non-negative uh, here with the psi. <coughs> and uh, to compare them, uh, RF is the same as the spinorial one, uh, and both of those are half of the H from the mu bubble uh, story. But anyways, they're all very equivalent, which is the kind of a surprising thing. Uh, we're all kind of converging onto these same results uh, with the same uh, you know, underlying principle, you know, the same un underlying ODE appearing uh, from three different approaches a priori. OK, so what is the game that we're going to be playing today uh, <clears throat> in the results that I'm going to mention at the end here? Uh, well, you got two things going on. So you have these quantities, the ODE thing and this Euler characteristic, and then you have F compared to the mean curvature. And so there's two different games you can play. You can say, oh, suppose I tailor my F so that the right hand or the left hand side is has a sign, then that tells me a sign, you know, if the left hand side is negative, then that tells me the right hand side's got to be negative. So then that tells me something about this uh, little f. Or, which is what I'll say next is the more direct way is choose f so that this right hand side is non negative. And then that will tell you some uh, information about the mean curvature of the boundary of your manifold. So that's how you use this theorem. You choose f appropriately, depending on what you want to prove. Control this Euler characteristic theorem. Uh, and then that tells you a theorem about uh, the mean curvature of the boundary. It has to have a certain sign. You know, like the left-hand side can't be negative, is all I'm saying. OK. So let me, let me run through the uh, different uh, uh, scenarios here. So let's look at a torus band situation. So suppose you have a, this is all in dimension three, by the way, because we're using uh, Gauss-Bonnet, and uh, the picture for higher dimensions is not clear. But uh, <clears throat> Let's take a look in dimension three here. Suppose you have a, and we proved something more general, but let me tell you the most uh, easy to state things. Um, okay, and this is um, yet to appear, by the way, in, in preparation. Uh, okay, so suppose you have a torical band with scalar curvature at least six. Um, now, from, you know, basically the 80s, we know there is no positive scalar curvature metric on a torus band with uh, mean convex boundary. So we already know that there has to be a point on the boundary with negative mean curvature. Okay, so, so you can define a positive number H naught by saying negative it is the minimum of the mean curvature of the boundary of your torus band. <coughs> then you get a width estimate, a sharp width estimate. So with that H naught in hand, uh, consider this arctangent quantity here. And we can say that the width of the torus band cannot exceed four thirds arc tangent of H naught over two, which is notice strictly less than the, the number that we saw earlier in the gromov lawson theorem. And if the quality is achieved here, then uh, the gradient of U becomes a conformal killing field, an integrable conformal killing field. And um, then you split as a warped product and you know, by a little bit more analysis, you know that the level sets are, uh, or yeah, the level sets will be flat. And so you can show that you're a warped, you know, the, you're the optimal warped product. And the proof is you choose F like so. Choose F to be tangent of three halves distance to the left hand side boundary minus this D plus or minus uh, divided by two the width of your manifold divided by two. And then compute that this, uh, the, the ODE quantity is positive. And so you get uh, positivity of the right-hand side. Oh, and the Euler characteristic, because of the cohomology of a torus cross an interval, there's no spherical classes. And every level, every component of a level set of a, a space-time harmonic function will have to be homologically non-trivial. So there's no spherical, classes appearing over here. There's no positive term over here, so you can ignore this term. It doesn't, doesn't penalize you in any way. OK. Dimitri, uh, oh, just yeah. to let you know that uh, if you want to leave time for questions, 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me just say one, uh, two more things then. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in 30 seconds. Okay, so for the, uh, uh, you can prove the La Rule theorem and a kind of refined, all, all of these, all of these theorems that we're getting are slightly refined versions of the, of the classical ones I mentioned already, because they compare mean curvatures and they, uh, you know, in a quantified way. Uh, we also have a La Rule theorem. Uh, here, there's a little bit of trickery involved, but you want to choose the F to be a cotangent function. Uh, and there's some leftover stuff that you need to worry about because the or the characteristic of level sets in this case are not tori, they're they're spherical, so you have to deal with those that extra or the characteristic term. And then there is also a version of uh, the uh, uh, yeah, there's a there's a version of the uh, two theorem uh, where if you have a Ricci bigger than two three manifold, uh, then you can say that. Uh, uh, there can be no, then, then the maximum uh, normal injectivity radius of an embedded torus is uh, uh, no bigger than pi over two. And an interesting consequence of this is, in my opinion, if you have a three manifold with Ricci curvature bigger than two, then any half link in your three manifold, it, it must be, uh, it, it cannot be distance uh, bigger than. Uh, pi over two. The two components of this half link cannot uh, exceed distance uh, pi over two. Anyway, so that's, yeah, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Dimitri, thank you very much for a beautiful talk. All right. So uh, questions? Well, I, I suppose I can I can maybe kick us off. Um, Dimitri, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, such a beautiful talk. I can see that you're a student of Gromov. You have these beautiful, you know, intuitions and pictures, and and uh, it's very broad. So thank you for leading us through a, a beautiful talk. That was great. Um, now, a couple of questions. Uh, can you go back to the mass formula when you had written it down for the first time? Hmm. Yeah. So just on the basis of that, um, can you do a version of what you just did? So what you just showed us with the band inequality? But rather than assuming something about the scalar curvature and the mean curvature, you assume something about the dominant energy scalar and theta plus, theta minus, something of that nature. Um, yeah, but I think you just I think you just get uh, the positive mass theorem, at least in the way I've set things up here. Um, no, no, I mean the so. Looking at this formula, you get the DEC scalar, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now go back to the band inequality. I'm saying, can you get a distance estimate for a DEC band, right? And 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 where theta plus comes in now, and the DEC scalar comes in, and etc. <clears throat> uh, well, not quite. So I would. So the the. the the, I don't know, how do I answer the question? So, uh, so let me, let me, let me just, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you see the point, but the point is that like, if, if you have strict DC uh, and say like theta plus is strictly positive, theta minus uh, is strictly negative on the torus band, that, that, that probably can't happen, right? So well, okay. So you, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. So you can you can have um, there are initial data on tori that are satisfy the dominant energy condition. That's well, no, that that's fine. But I'm talking about getting distance bounds and things like that. If if you assume the DEC has some lower bound, like positive lower bound. So just just this. Uh, oh, well, pos mm. you know, I I want to prove. A, a, a DEC generalization of the torus band inequality. And I want to use your technique in three dimension. And, and I'm just saying, 
just looking at this formula, it seems like there's a chance. Uh, also, okay, so you need to get distance involved and then create some other initial data, a secondary initial data, which involves that distance function. And then you could hope to prove something. But fundamentally, if I have extra positivity around, I can make that my friend, right? Somehow. I mean, I don't know exactly how the inequalities work in your paper, so you'd have to check, but I'm just wondering, is this something you could do or is, some, is this possible? Yeah, it's something you can try, but the, but the fundamental thing is here, it's this is a precarious scenario, positive scalar curvature on a torus band because the torus doesn't have positive scalar curvature. But if you have dominant, a really big dominant energy condition on a torus band, that's not precarious because tori have, you know, it's fine for a torus to have a big dominant energy condition. So that's that's uh, why I'm it's it's, it's maybe it's it, maybe there's something there I'm not seeing. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's interesting. So that's not quite that's not quite right, right? So you can have um, it's it's almost right, right? But it's not quite. So when when you have um, you know, LOCAM shows us, right, that you can't have these DEC islands. Yeah, no DEC islands. Right, but but if you have a torus, uh, you know, connect some, so the way, you know, you, you can show, for instance, that you can't have DEC strict and then like, uh, and then flat outside of, of, of these, of a compact set, say for torus connect some, you can also show that for, um, when when the when the sum and is is say non compact, and uh, you know there's some further works that sh that you know tell us that you have um, you're averse to PEC for something that lies between the say two you know T twos on the on the T threes. This was actually a this is in the paper of Greg I think yeah maybe. Right, so, so you, could, you could, okay, so I believe a theorem like the following, dominant energy condition torus island type of theorem where you have a flatness on a, like a skeleton, but you know, like a, like so on these uh, yeah. pieces. Uh, then I believe there is a, a, a torus band in that kind of setting where you assume that, that you have some uh, uh, non-trivial uh, homologically uh, regions of flatness and you have, dominant energy condition on the rest. Yeah, 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 definitely. I definitely believe that too, yeah. Yeah, you have like a, a torus band that's flat outside, a torus island band, basically, right? Yeah. That's what just, yeah. And, and I'd expect, would, yeah. yeah. The proof I'm not, is not clear, but that-, that No, but I, it should be, yeah, it should be something that, that probably can be done. Yeah, good point. Are there any other questions? So maybe, Dimitri, can you go back to uh, the last few slides you had? Um, so, so tell us more about this uh, hop flink, uh, you know, corollary. It's it sounds really fun. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so it's also a corollary of the Zeus work as well. It's just just noticing that if you have a, you know, this is originally why I was wondering about this question. Uh, but if you just have a a hop flink embedded in your manifold, and uh, then a tubular neighborhood. of uh, this uh, link would, uh, the complement, I should say, of a tubular neighborhood of the link would satisfy uh, the conditions of the above uh, band type theorem. Uh, and you could estimate its uh, boundary mean curvature. You have to do kind of a Taylor expansion of the, of the boundary mean curvature in the, in the smallness of the, of the tubular neighborhood. Uh, to uh, kind of optimally compare it to uh, the the round sphere, uh, but that that can be accomplished. So you can you can uh, just apply this above band type version of the uh, uh, the estimate on the normal objectivity radius of 
uh, embedded tori in this situation. So here, you know, the 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 tubular neighborhood. The point is that the tubular neighborhood of a uh, the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of a embedded S one is T two, and you can the same logic of of the above applies. But but there's okay, uh, yeah. But doesn't this prove something more general than like does it have to be a hop link? I mean, it seems like it could be any, right? Oh, sure, but that's just the only rigid scenario. Yeah, uh, any link, any any two things that are linked. Yeah. Yeah, right. the, the ones yeah. that are furthest far, the furthest away are the the half links in uh, S three. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's 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 not it's it's a it's a really nice statement. I mean, it's a it's a it's a fun fun statement. The no spherical H two is is uh, is it the usual thing that? Oh yeah, so, so there, yeah, I should say there is in some scenarios we can weaken that, but uh, actually in Sue's work there is a similar assumption. But um, for these other theorems, uh, I am assuming that there's no spherical homology in the manifold, the band that we're talking about. Um, the situation of applying this technique when you have spherical classes is more complicated. Yeah, as, as I'm sure you know, but that's it's the usual, it's the usual issue. Except it's harder to deal with in a band because you can't just cut out homology with a minimal surface, uh, which is what you would usually do when you apply these sorts of techniques uh, uh, to uh, the closed manifolds uh, because the minimizer might run run into the boundary. So I think get more complicated. And depending on the which of these three theorems you're talking about and what exact scenario, uh, you, you know the the theorem that we prove uh, may or may not have a, a condition on on H two. So I, I'll I'll just uh, for the sake of this talk, I, I will say that we're imposing that on all of the theorems. So you you uh... oh yeah, one thing I wanted to mention by the way is that there's no spinorial proof of this. Uh, uh, this one. So every every other result that I talked about in this talk, there is a spinorial version of it. With a, you know, you can prove it with spinners with potential, but and no such thing. There's not. I don't even have a hint of a, a spinner proof for this uh, normal injectivity radius of Tori. I'd be interested in that. Well. Uh... There are no other questions. I think we should thank Dimitri again for a really brilliant exposition uh, on all these uh, you know, fascinating ideas. So Dimitri, thank you very much. Thank you very much.